God wants for you and I to live productive lives. I can, I can stand up here today and I can say that with full assurance and knowing that that is true for one very obvious reason. And it's because the Bible says it's true. God wants for you and I to live productive lives. We've spent a couple of different occasions over the last couple of months touching on this, the vision meeting, and then on one of the Sundays following the vision meetings. But it involves the passage of Scripture where Jesus was teaching about how he is the vine and we are the branches. And he said these words, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vineyard keeper. Every branch in me that does not produce fruit, he removes. And he prunes every branch that produces fruit so that it will produce more fruit. See, the Bible teaches, Jesus taught, that we are to be fruitful. This is part of God's design and that God will prune us to make us even more fruitful. As you follow the next few verses in the passage, he brings up the word fruit again a couple of more times. And then he closes out the passage with verse 8 by saying this, My Father is glorified by this, that you produce much fruit and prove to be my disciple. So first he mentions fruit, then he says more fruit, and then by the time he's done t teaching on the topic, he talks about there needing to be much fruit in our life. And he adds to it in this verse that this is how God is glorified. God is glorified. It's not just the singing of songs that brings glory to God. The Bible very clearly teaches that there are other ways that God is glorified in our lives and being fruitful in the words of Jesus. That is certainly part of it. And that's what's behind this whole above and beyond emphasis that we've been uh, involved with over the last couple of months. We've now spent a total of eight Sundays breaking it down and looking at some of the key passages teaching important concepts regarding being followers of Jesus. Not the least of which was this particular passage in Matthew chapter 10, verse 39. In fact, it became a central verse used in both of the first two messages of the series. It kind of set the tone for the entire series. In the words of Jesus, we read this. If you cling to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you will find it. It almost appears like an oxymoron. You know, it's just kind of like, wait a minute, you know, we'll find it if we lose it, and if we keep it, we'll lose it. You know, it just, but it's true. Jesus says, regarding our life, if you cling to it, if you approach life in a white-knuckled sort of a way that it's yours and you're not about to let go of it, then Jesus says you're going to end up one day losing it. But if you will lose your life, and that's an open-handed, not a white knuckle thing. Open hand. If you lose your life, then you'll find it. It's a key concept. It's at the very foundation of being a follower of Jesus. This is where it all starts. And one of the most memorable ways that it is impressed upon us in a visual form comes early in the life, in the ministry of Jesus, when he's calling his disciples to him. And there's more than one passage, and there's more than one way that it's referred to. But the way that, that we focused on primarily throughout the series is when it came to James and John. They were sitting in a boat, and they were doing what they knew best. They were fishermen by trade. It was an honest living. It was, it was what uh, basically was being handed down to them, not only by their dad, but probably their dad's dad. Uh, their dad had a fishing operation that eventually was probably going to be passed on to them. It was an honest way to make a living, what James and John were doing. There wasn't anything shady about it. It was an honest living around Galilee. And here they were in their boat, and they were mending their nets. What was different on this particular day was Jesus was on the shore. And he stopped. And he looked at them sitting there in their boat. And he said, come, follow me. And I'll make you fish for people. And James and John, they dropped their nets. And they stepped out of the boat. 
And that's what we've been talking about. It's time to step out of the boat. They stepped out into the unknown. What they knew was what was inside that boat. They knew fishing frontward and backward. This was their whole life. But Jesus came along, and they willingly, in the words of that verse, of what Jesus said at a later occasion, they willingly lost their life so that they might actually find it in Christ. That's what this entire series has been spinning off of, is that that visual that we get of James and John stepping out of the boat, Peter and Andrew and Matthew behind his, his uh, um, tax collecting booth. As long, and here's a key thought in my, my opening thoughts here, this is the key thought right here. As long as we're thinking, as long as we approach life in such a way that we're thinking it's our life to live, as long as that's the way we're approaching life, it's my life to live, then we're missing the point. Then we haven't gotten it yet. It's taught in multiple places in Scripture, like Romans 6, says give yourselves completely to God. That means everything, lock, stock, and barrel. You're giving it over to Him. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 that Jesus died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for the one who who died for them and was raised. You see, he died for us. And as a result, we should live for him. For a Christian to live with the kind of mindset that says, it's my life to live, I'll choose how to live it, it's obvious you haven't gotten it yet. Because it's not your life anymore. It's his life. He bought it by going to the cross. And that holds true not only that holds truth not only in regard to the outward stuff in our life but the inward stuff as well. You see his values need to become our values and we talked about that in one of the Sundays. His values become our values. His priorities become our priorities. His purpose in life becomes our purpose. You see we take upon ourselves the mind of Christ and that's why Paul said we have the mind of Christ and in order for that to be able to happen that means that there needs to be a transformation that takes place in the renewing of our minds Romans chapter 12 there needs to be that change that takes place on the inside of us starting with our very thoughts and if that happens then in effect we're going to end up living differently than what we used to live it's just a natural cause and effect. If you're made new in the attitude of your minds, you take upon yourself the values of Christ, you're going to live differently than you would have otherwise. There's no ifs, ands, and buts about that. And some people might look at that and they might think, you know, you're a fanatic. Well, so be it if they want to throw labels out like that. But this is what is to happen. We take upon ourselves the values of Christ. We live in a way that may look like to others upside down living because we're living the way Christ wants us to live. As followers of Jesus, our basic orientation is that everything in our lives is his. Everything. There's no exceptions. Everything. And that even includes our bodies. 1 Corinthians 6 says, you are not your own, you are bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Even your body is no longer yours, it's his. It's the temple of the Holy Spirit. Here's a key concept that's found in the pages of the Bible, and this is how I'm going to wrap up this first section. A key concept found in the Bible. You've got one life to live. And that's what's given to each one of us. We have one life. It may not be the same length as others, but we all have just one life to live. We cannot afford just to live our lives on autopilot. That is not an option. We cannot afford just to go with the flow and do what everyone else or do what everyone else around us is doing. No. We got one life to live. Make it count. We need to live with the determination to make our lives count. You only have one life to spend. So spend it wisely. One day, you will look back over your life. 
Will you have any regrets? It's a good question. It's a question, actually, that was part of our survey that was in the bulletin on the connection card last Sunday, you know, where I asked, do you have regrets in life? And uh, as we looked at the responses that were turned in last Sunday, uh, it's obvious that uh, there was a resounding yes that was a part of the response to that. That a number of people have regrets of one type or another. Some are very specific. Some mention things like uh, having regrets about a divorce that they experienced in their life or regrets about not staying home when their kids were growing up. Um, some didn't try to be specific. A couple people did and, and just put down too many to count, you know, was their answer. Um, there was also a response that was given, came through several times, and it was a response that basically said that their regret was uh, having waited so long to get serious with God. That they, they, they put it off too long. I wish they would have done it earlier. Yeah, the fact of the matter is that regrets, yeah, that is part of the equation of life. It is something that we encounter. And, and here's the thing. The Bible in multiple places says that we will one day stand before God and will give an account of our life. The Bible teaches that. For example, in Romans chapter 14, it says these words, that we will all stand before the judgment seat of God and each one of us will give an account of himself to God. And I want, want to remind you, the book of Romans was written to Christians. It was written to the church in Rome. So sometimes we look at the, all of this and we just kind of think, well, that only has to do with unbelievers. No, it, it, it's actually found in the scripture talking about believers as well. There will come a day when we will be reflecting over our life. Now, I know in Christ our past is forgiven. And praise the Lord that that's true. And a number of people indicated that on their connection card on the survey last week that, you know, thankfully it's all forgiven. And that is true, and we can celebrate that. But the point of the matter is, we will reflect back over our life when our days on earth are over. The Bible teaches that. And the thing is, at that time, you're not going to be able to, and I'm not going to be able to go back and relive any of them and to try to do anything about any of them at that point. That's why it's all the more important that you and I live our lives now in such a way that we'll be able to look back on our lives later and we'll be able to see some clear occasions when we can say, I did it. As we look back over our life and we recount the years that we spent here on earth, that we'll be able to look back and say, I did it. I stepped out of the boat. I did it on that occasion and I did it on that occasion. It's important that we have some of that as, as a part of our life and a part of being followers of Christ. Times that our faith gave us the courage to step beyond our fears and to do something for God. Deep down inside each of us, there is a desire to do something of value that has lasting significance. I mean, studies have been done. I read one study one time. I think I shared this in a sermon a couple years ago a study that was done of 95-year-olds. You know, you had to be 95 to be included in this study. And they said, what's your three biggest regrets? And this was one of them on the list. I have not done anything of real significance in my life. And if I could relive my life, that's what I'd change. I, th I, think, it's, I think it's found within each, each of us. Some, some, it might be buried a little deeper than in others, but, but we all have a desire to do something of value that will have lasting significance in our lives. And I think part of that is what explains the phenomenon that has been referred to for some time, midlife crisis. You know, people get to a certain point in time in their life, and they start looking back, and they start reflecting, and, uh, you know, they just kind of like, Ugh, you know, what, what have I done? What have I accomplished? What difference have I made in my life? Solomon experienced that, and he records that in, in a lot of the chapters of Ecclesiastes. But here's a typical verse in Ecclesiastes 2.11. He said, 
As I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless, like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. Now, by the time Solomon wrote that, he was at least in his 40s, probably in his 50s, maybe even a little older than that. And he was looking back on his life, and he says, Man, it's all been just chasing. He could not see anything of real significance that he had been a part of. You know, unfortunately, fear is one of the top culprits that keeps people from stepping out of the boat. Fear, as much as anything, I think, gets in the way. I've shared a number of stories, you know, in the last two months in the, from the Bible that represent or illustrate that point. Let me share one last one with you today. This one is found in Numbers chapters 13 and 14, and it involves, it involves a time in the history of Israel when they were given specific instruction to pick one man from every tribe to send them into what was called the Promised Land. And it was called the Promised Land because God had promised this land to his people. And so there were 12, since there were 12 tribes, there were 12 men that were hand-selected to go in on this mission to, to check out the land. And when they went in there, they found out that it was just incredible. They started describing it as a land that flowed with milk and honey. They, the produce of the land was, was so bountiful that they even took a cluster of grapes and it took two men on a, with a pole to carry that big cluster of grapes. And, and, and it was a bountiful land. It was an attractive land. It was a land that just kind of drew them to it. However, it was at around that same time that fear started kicking in. Some reservations with some of these 12 men. Reservations that led to doubts, that led to just outright fear. We're like grasshoppers compared to the people in this land. They're giants. They live in fortified cities. What do we have to combat that with? What's this going to be like when I pack my family up and I move my family here, my kids and my parents, and I move them here? What's going to end up happening to us? And it was all the unknowns and all of the maybe this and maybe that, the, the, the insecurity that, stir, that was stirring up within them, the fear that just kind of took, uh, took them a took them a direction they shouldn't have gone. And they ended up saying, no, let's not do it. In fact, the majority of them, five out of six, ten out of twelve of the total, they said, let's go back to Egypt. Now, when they were in Egypt, they were slaves in Egypt, and there was nothing comfortable about the life they were living in Egypt, but it was a life that they knew. And so they were at this particular point, let's go back to Egypt. Because we don't want to go into the unknown. We don't want to experience all of this stuff that possibly could end up happening. And so fear paralyzed them. And in effect, this is what the result was. Fear prevented them from experiencing a special blessing from God. I mean, that's the bottom line of the story for me regarding 10 of those 12 spies. Now, the other two, they ended up still experiencing it, but they were much older by the time they experienced it, but it was their fear that kept them from experience. It prevented them from experiencing a special blessing from God. And so today I've got a question for you. What about you? What is God laying on your heart? What has God been prompting for you to do? That maybe you're letting fear get the best of you. Sometimes, you know, life... Sometimes life gets rolling so fast that we find ourselves just kind of doing all that we can do to hang on. We've got so many things going on in our life, whether it be the day-to-day -day responsibilities as far as work and as far as, you know, meals around the home and upkeep at the house and all of this kind of stuff. And, and, and when it comes to work, I mean, we got the work hours. If you're a salaried person or if you have a business of your own, you know that work hours, boy, that can really get crazy too because sometimes you'll find yourself coming home in the middle of the evening, sometimes late at night, and that's not a not a maybe not an unusual thing for you so you've got all of this stuff the day-to-day -day stuff 
the work, the extra hours at work. You got kids' activities and sporting events and homework and, and all that stuff relating to school. On top of that, you throw into it uh, some of the health situations that invade your life uninvited. You know, whether it be to you or some of your loved ones, you got health struggles that, that become a part of the equation. And, and, and before you know it, you're doing everything you can possibly do just to hang on in the flurry of everything that is going on in your life. And when a break eventually occurs, you just want to use it to catch your breath. Because <laughs> you're so caught up in everything that's happening. You just want to use that break. To catch your breath and so you go to Redbox and you get a movie or two so during your break you have some downtime and get your breath or maybe if you have a little more time than that you plan a weekend maybe even if you still got a vacation day available you plan a three-day weekend a little trip just in order to kind of get your bearings again to catch your wind before the next flurry of activity kicks in and you're going like all gangbusters again. And that's the way life can be. Life, in that sense, is a lot like a roller coaster. Yeah, you know, and it's been a while since I've been on a roller coaster. Two or three years ago, we took our, our grandson and went to Worlds of Fun, so rode, rode some of those over there but uh, uh, these roller coasters you know you, you get in those cars that you sit there and you put that that bar that safety bar down and and uh, man you're going around you're turning corners on a dime and you're kind of going this way and that way and sometimes upside down and and it's all that you can do just to hang on I mean you've seen on TV sometimes some or maybe certain websites some of the pictures they have cameras mounted where they're getting someone's picture right at a particular curve in a roller coaster and i mean that tells the story right there a picture's worth a you know a thousand words as far as you know just kind of people screaming or whatever and, and of course the brave ones want to raise their hands but still they're like e you know I mean, it's just like wow it's everything we can do just to hang on because all these different curves and ups and downs and loops and all this but eventually you get to this point where all of a sudden you got a slow, long climb, right? And the chain that's pulling the cars, chick, 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 you know, kind of, kind of going up. And all of a sudden, you can catch your breath. I mean, you can even if you know the per well, even if you don't know the person next to you, you can visit with them. I mean, you're not doing much visiting otherwise, are you? You know, but now you can visit with them. You can say, "Look at the view." This is great. Where to put my camera? Yeah, you know, I mean, you can do stuff like that while you're, you know, kind of catching your breath. But as soon as you crest the top, it's like, hang on, here we go again. And that, in a lot of ways, is the way life is. Life comes at us in bunches. And, and you know, sometimes it, it comes at us so fast, so furious, that uh, at times, before we know it, chunks of time have passed. Weeks have turned into months. Months have turned into years. And we're just kind of like, wow, where's all the time going? Last time I checked, it was 15 years ago. I mean, it's because so many things have been happening. And you know what? In the middle of all of that, and I know this to be true because I have heard it many, many times. In the middle of all that, it is easy for well-meaning, good-hearted people it is easy for them to ca get caught up thinking, when I get a chance, I want to make sure I do something for God. In view of everything that God has done for me, when I get a chance, I want to do something for God in return for all that he's done for me. Yeah, yeah, that's something. I'm going to do it too when I get a chance. I stand here today to tell you, you've got a chance right now. You've got a chance right now. That's what Above and Beyond has all been all about, is emphasizing that, that this is our chance right now. It's not next week, it's not next month, it's not next year. Our chance is right now to do something for God. The scripture says in Ephesians chapter 5 that we should be very careful how we live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity. God's counsel to us is that we are to seize 
opportunities while we can. Or to say it another way, God is basically telling us we should live in a way that we are opportunistic. Keeping our eyes open, looking and jumping on the opportunities that present themselves. It is now the time for us to prepare for our commitment card with Above and Beyond. So I'm going to ask our ushers if they will get up at this time and uh, they will start distributing the cards. Uh, they will be going up and down the aisle. Now in here, in here, everybody should have a pen. I see some pens laying on the front row and, and then the rest of you should have a pen in the pocket uh, in front of you in one of the chairs in front of you. So you should have something that you can write with. But in just a moment, the ushers are going to be handing out these commitment cards and and uh, as they do that here they come as they do that I want to encourage you don't fill it out yet okay when it comes to you when it's passed out to you don't don't start filling it out yet we want to take a couple of moments before we we fill them out I just want to say while they're getting ready uh, doing this that uh, Above and Beyond has been a great experience for our church. I, I really believe that is true. I, I imagine that, you know, there's, although I really haven't heard much of that, but I imagine that there's probably a few that, you know, when it was announced we were moving into all of this, that uh, they kind of checked out, you know, it's just like, yeah, that's not for me. I'm not going to be a part of that. And go ahead, go ahead and come up the aisles, guys. Go ahead and start passing them out. Um, but I imagine that there have been a few that, uh, you know, maybe, maybe checked out early on. And that's unfortunate, you know, to their loss, you know, that, that they did that. But I have been getting communications in various types um, of people that are just telling me just how blessed they are and how God has really spoken to them, you know, through the things we've been talking about and the prayer emphasis that we've had. And, and uh, you know, and, and I think only good things can come of that. So I'm excited already with what has happened with Above and Beyond, and November 4th hadn't even taken place. So I was already excited coming into today. It's been good for our church. You know, but it is that time. It is that time, if we haven't done it yet, it's that time for us to step out of the boat. I want to encourage you to do a couple of things on yours right now, just, just for the moment. There's something else we're going to do in just a moment, but while they're passing them out, go ahead and write your name. There's two different places that uh, I want to ask you to fill out. On the commitment card itself, the top, it has the name and address. want to make sure we have correct information there. Um, so, so as legibly as possible, go ahead and fill out your name and your address on the card. But I also want to encourage you on the envelope, make sure your name is on the envelope too. When you drop the card off here in a moment, the card will be in the envelope. But uh, um, in short order, it's going to end up being separated from the envelope. The envelope serves a specific purpose because we want to make sure we're sending a communication to all of those that weren't with us today. And that's how we're determining they weren't with us today is by the envelope. So make sure your name is on the envelope. You don't have to give any more information. And certainly, you don't have to put any dollar figures on the envelope, um, but just your name. Now, let me say this before we start filling out the, uh, the amounts. I understand that Tuesday is Election Tuesday. I have been a little bit surprised that I've only had maybe a grand total of two people, and if I exaggerate, I'll say three, three people that have said something to me of concern because of the election and what might that mean as far as things, you know, around the corner and all of this, and especially in regards to above and beyond the commitments we made. So I really haven't had hardly anybody say anything to me about it. But I want to say this, because I believe it still might be on people's minds. It does not make any difference who it is that is in the White House, and it does not ultimately make any difference who it is that is on Wall Street. What matters is who is sitting on the throne in heaven. Okay? That ultimately, that ultimately is where it's at. 
And, and, and that's, that's why faith, this, 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 is, this is an expression of faith. This is a step of faith. You know, this is the reason why back in 2001, when we did the original campaign that built phase one, we did that right in the shadow of 9-11. Because we knew, regardless of what was happening around us, what matters most is who is on the throne. And we continued to move forward. And just had an outstanding result that we still celebrate to this day. I want to encourage you to spend a moment in prayer with me. Um, I know probably a number, maybe even most of you have already come in here today having already prayed about it and you already know, you know what you're going to be filling out on your commitment card. But there may be a few in here that still haven't even made that decision. And so I, I want to give an opportunity here that, that we might pray. And if you're sitting next to your spouse, I'd encourage you to maybe take your spouse's hand since it's kind of a mutual decision that's playing into this. Take their hand and, and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, you know why we're here today, and you know what we're doing right now, this moment. We seek your direction. We seek that you would lead us, that you would nudge us. Give us the nudge that we need. Help us. Help us to have the faith, the faith to follow your lead. Lord, I pray that you would use this above and beyond to stretch each one of us in multiple ways. And this, what we're talking about right now, being one of those ways to your glory, Lord. Stretch us. Help us to be more fruitful, more productive for you. And we pray all of that so that you would be glorified. It's in Christ's name I pray. Does what I have belong to me or God? It's a good question. But we already know the answer to that question, don't we? Yeah, we know that. Above and beyond is about more than money. It includes every resource that God has placed in our lives. And those come in all different kinds of shapes and sizes. It might include our abilities talents, skill sets, whatever, whatever terminology you want to use to describe it, but it includes that, that God has, has made you in such a way, he's wired you up in such a way that uh, you've just got certain skills, certain abilities. And, and, and so stewardship includes that. It also includes your time, and that's one thing we all share in common. We have an equal amount of time, seven days a week, 168 hours a week to work with. You know, but that's part of what we are to be stewards of. It includes our opportunities. Opportunities that come our way. That we are to be good stewards of those. Seizing those, using those for the God's glory. It may also include uh, uh, like your marriage. Your children. Your family. You are to be a good steward. As far as your family goes as well. What is it that God has been prompting you about that perhaps you've been somewhat ignoring him? You know, we mentioned uh, about Elijah in one of the previous messages and how God spoke to him in that whisper. What has God been whispering to you? What has he been nudging you about that maybe you've been uh, doing a little bit of foot dragging on because uh, for one reason or another you know you just don't really think you're the guy or you you're the gal or you've got the time or whatever someone else would do better or whatever it is what is it that God has been stirring within you about you see the Bible's pretty clear about this in 1 Corinthians 15 it says so then my dear friend stand firm and steady Keep busy always in your work for the Lord, since you know that nothing you do in the Lord's service is ever useless. There is nothing you will ever do in the Lord's service that is useless. And sometimes we may kick ourselves a little bit and think, oh, I, I'm not that good at this, and someone else would do a whole lot better teaching these kids or doing this particular responsibility. And, uh, but the Bible goes on record in saying, that when you do something in the name of the Lord and when you serve him in some capacity for his glory, it is not in vain. 
And you may not fully understand, even on this side of, of glory, you know, what, what and how God uses something that you use, but, uh, but there will come a day when you will be able to understand and appreciate that a whole lot more. That God can take some of the seeds that you plant in your life and, and in the lives of others that, uh, that you don't see any outcome of, but yet there is outcome. It just hasn't been made apparent to you. A couple years ago, I got a letter from a guy up in Iowa, and this was a guy that uh, came to junior high weeky camp. He was, I don't remember, seventh or an eighth grader. And back when I was deaning camp, back in 1989, and he sent me this, sent me this letter just a couple years back, and uh, in the letter, he was just saying, I just, I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you for uh, that summer, for taking the time to be the dean of a week of camp and just investing yourself in the way that you did. And, and he went as far as to say that much of what I am today, I am because of you. And, uh, and he was involved in ministry and all this. And, and he described himself a little bit, said, you probably don't remember me. But after he described himself, I, I did. I remembered him. And, uh, and But I had no clue. I had absolutely no clue that I had had any kind of impact on him that lasted beyond the week, honestly. And Because uh, if you haven't experienced it before, when you're working with 110 junior hires, you feel like you're going insane. Yeah, so I, did, I didn't know I was accomplishing anything. But that was just out of the blue. You know, for him to have the thoughtfulness to send that letter, you know, it just, wow. I mean, it was a reminder of this very point that I'm talking about. There will always be reasons to stay in the boat. Everybody's got thoughts that go through their mind as to reasons why, well, no, I'm going to play it a little cautious. I'm not going to step out. You know, it's a little bit too risky in my situation, my schedule, and my experiences in life. You know, I'll let someone else. Everyone's got a reason. Everyone's got a reason to stay in the boat. But you know what? Sometimes it's time to set the caution aside and to step out to new experiences and to go where you've never gone before and to do what you've never done before, to try what you've never tried before. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, what, that's what scriptures like Proverbs chapter 3, that's part of what it's talking about when it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he'll make your path straight. He'll guide your steps. And for a person that says, well, you know, I'm not going to do that, and I know that need is, is there in that situation, and yeah, I mean, I, I could see how I could fit into that, but I'm not going to because I've got this reason and that reason, and it's just not a good time for me in my life at this time. And, and for a person to go through all of that, they're, they're doing the very thing that this verse says don't do. They're leaning on their own understanding. They're thinking that they know better. And they're opting out because of this, this, and this based on their own understanding, their own rationale. And the scripture says instead that we, is, we need to trust in the Lord. And he's going to guide our steps. I am glad that there are people that do that very thing. Because in addition to what I'm reading in scripture, people that do that very thing serve as an inspiration for me. You know, we've got a couple of groups in, in our church that... Uh, have uh, a plan that's been stirring and starting to develop and it's a mentorship ministry it's going to involve some of our I mistakenly used the wrong word in the 745 it's going to involve some of our older women oh, no that's, that was what I said up there our mature women I'm, I was corrected it's, honestly I didn't do that on purpose it, it involves it involves it's, it, it's a ministry that involves some of our more mature women. Keep, keep Sue away from me after the service, Rick, okay? Um, and, and how they're going to be pairing up with some of the younger women in the church and developing mentorship relationships. You know, and, and I hope that you know, here, uh, some, in one of the coming months, we're going to create a video or something and provide more information on that and what's happening. But, but to me, I mean, that, that's, that's an example. People stepping out of the boat, doing something. that can be a little scary getting into that kind of an arrangement. I'm reminded of Tim and Britt Fitzgerald. If 
few years ago, deciding that they, they really felt that there was a need for a Celebrate Recovery ministry here in the church. And knowing full well that it was going to take some real commitment of time, hours, on a weekly basis. They signed up and said, we'll take the lead on this. Because that's what I'm talking about. I'm reminded of some of the professors that I've had in college. This weekend, you know, we've, we've got one of them and his wife, Nancy. That uh, when, 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 when he got done serving on the mission field as a young man, he went to teach young men and women in a Bible college setting for a bunch of years. Forty some years? Is that what's that? Thirty some. Okay. Well for some of us that were your students, it felt like it was forty some. No. Yeah. <laughs> Thirty some years. And then getting to retirement age and and the age when you can kind of start thinking about kicking back, what do they do? They pack their bags, and they move to the Middle East. And they get involved in ministry into their 70s. That's the sort of thing we're talking about here. That, that represents some of the examples. In addition to, to what was happening just a moment ago here, that is in the spirit of above and beyond. The very thing we've been talking about for the last eight Sundays. As I shared in the vision meetings that most of you attended, it is my hope that in the months ahead, there are going to be a number of individuals who are going to end up approaching the elders with thoughts of a brand new ministry team that doesn't presently exist in the church. Because they have, for some reason or another, a heightened sense of awareness about something. And they're willing to take the lead in it. And I hope we have some of that developing in 2013 as a result of all this. One last time. One last time. Let me share with you the theme verses that encapsulate above and beyond the very thing we've been emphasizing for two months now. Colossians 3, verse 2 is where we get the word above. It says, set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. The whole idea here is that we don't live our lives with, with just this life, the here and now, being the sum total of what we're really seeing and thinking and considering and, and allowing to determine what we do with our time. But rather instead that we raise our eyes and we keep eternity in mind and allow that to impact the things we're doing in our life and why we're doing it. The word beyond comes from Philippians 2, verse 4, where it says, look out for one another's interests, not just your own. And the idea there is, is that we need, to be, we need to be thinking beyond ourselves. The natural inclination is, is that you kind of have tunnel vision and you're just kind of focused on yourself, your immediate family, maybe a few extended family members and some really, really close friends, and that is, is who you focus your attention on. But the challenge has been to go beyond that. Widen your attention and who you're thinking of and who you're willing to step out and to reach out and to try to provide assistance and help in whatever form that is needed. Whether it be someone who's just an acquaintance of yours in school or whether it be a co-worker that you see um, three or four times during the week or whether it be an acquaintance down the street or a total stranger you've never met before. We need to be oriented on others beyond ourselves. That's the above and beyond. And that is not just a campaign. That is a lifestyle that we are to live. Our ushers are going to get up at this time and be preparing for communion. And while they're doing that, let me just end my thoughts with this. This whole above and beyond, it's very, it very much describes Jesus. Because Jesus lived out his time here on earth and all that he did and taught and 
and of course the road that took him to the cross and, and, and it was all because he kept eternity in mind he wasn't living just for the here and now and it was also all because he was thinking of others namely you and me the cross would have never happened if Jesus wasn't focused on eternity and if he wasn't thinking on others but because that was his orientation it happened and we weekly get together and as a part of our time together we celebrate his death his burial his resurrection and might it not just be something we celebrate but might it also be something we allow to inspire us to live above and beyond as well. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the biblical challenge that we have had now for two months. And Father, I pray that this just won't be something we file away way back in our mind as kind of being a bit of an inspirational moment in the church's life and then just kind of go on and eventually forget about it. But rather instead, Lord, might it be part of what you use to reshape us and to mold us into being more Christ-like in the way we live our life. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his above and beyond orientation. His devotion to us. His consideration of the big picture of eternity. Help us to be more like Jesus.